When was the last time you were asked a very easy question? The kind of question you didn't have to think about, the kind of question that before the the asker even finished their question, you already had the answer in your head. As a pastor, I'm often asked a lot of questions, and usually they are not in that category of easy questions. Usually when people sit down with me, they have some issue going on in their life, something they want some clarity on, and so they don't ask me easy questions. They ask me the very difficult questions. Why why do bad things happen to good people? Why does suffering exist? If God is good and loving and cares for us and he created everything, why did he create mosquitoes and tornadoes and cats? Why are these things true? But every once in a while, I get asked a fairly easy question, a question that I already have the answer to without even having to think about it. Okay, I get a text from my buddy. Hey, hey, do you want to play golf tomorrow? Very easy question that I give a very easy answer to. Let me ask my wife. Okay, or Alex, amazing, love my wife to death. She texts me and she says, hey, hey, do you want me to cook dinner tonight? Easy question, easy answer, depends on what you're making, right? Uh, And sometimes, even this week, not exactly in my life, but I was asked this question. It's an easy question, easy answer. Did Texas A&M get absolutely snubbed by the NCAA tournament and not make it to the field of 64? Easy question, easy answer, absolutely. Fired up about that one today. Now, sometimes we get asked questions that on their face, they might seem like they are easy questions, but upon further inspection, they're a little bit deeper, they're a little bit more complicated, they're a little bit more tricky than we may have thought. Uh, That's what we're going to see here in a little bit in Luke chapter 18 with the question that's asked of Jesus. But I learned about this uh, in a very scary, somewhat embarrassing way about eight years ago. The fact that some questions on their face may seem quite simple, but in reality, they're not simple at all. So eight years ago, I was in between my junior and my senior year at Texas A&M. I was interning for the summer out at a wonderful Methodist church out in Richmond, Texas, and uh, following around a pastor there, really enjoyed doing that work. It was a great time. Um, But it was also an interesting time in life because uh, Alex and I had been dating for about two years by that point. And we were good Aggies, and we knew that, that you leave with this ring and you leave with this ring, right? And so um, we, we kind of knew uh, that, that, that engagement was, was on the table. So being down in Houston kind of gave me a nice little cover, not being around her in College Station, a nice little cover to sit down and have the conversation with Bob, her father. You know the conversation. And so uh, one afternoon, I I text Bob and I said, "Uh, hey, Bob, uh, just randomly, I I just thought, you know what? It'd be really great to buy you lunch soon. And I said, you you, you name the time and you name the place. Just want to have a casual lunch with you. No no, no, no ulterior motives here. Let's just have lunch, okay? Okay. Bob's a smart man. He knew what was going on. And so he, he texts back and he said, you know what, son? I've been waiting for you to ask me to lunch for a while now. So that sounds great. And he gives me a time and he says, let's meet uh, in a couple of days uh, at noon at Kelly's restaurant. And I said, great. That's in between both of us. He's in Houston. I'm in Houston. Wonderful. This is going to be great. So I spend those days in between uh, perfecting my speech, getting myself ready for this speech to give to hopefully my future father-in-law. And I've got the speech already, and then finally the day rolls around, and it's hard to concentrate at work, but I'm getting all my words just right, and then finally 11.15 rolls around. Okay, so, so I knew that Kelly's restaurant was 30 minutes from the church that I was working at, and so I was going to get there by 11.45, prove to this man that not only am I a great guy, but I'm responsible, and I show up early to things, it's going to be great. And so I get in my truck, my, my hands are, are shaking, and I'm driving. Uh, uh, 30 minutes later, I get to Kelly's restaurant, look down at my watch, it's 11.45, perfect. I got 15 minutes to freak out and to practice this speech about how much I love your daughter, I'm going to serve your daughter, I'm gonna be a great husband and father one day, all, all that, get that all ready. And I, I looked across the parking lot, don't see Bob's car anywhere, I thought, great, I got 15 minutes. So I run through the speech a couple of more times, 11.45 becomes 11.50, becomes 11.55, becomes noon. And I thought, you know what? Houston traffic's pretty bad. I'm not gonna be the son-in-law that's really naggy and calling him up like, yo, where are you at? I'm gonna give him some time, give him some space. It's gonna be fine. 12 o'clock noon becomes 12.05, becomes 12.30, 
10 becomes 12, 15, and suddenly I realize we might have an issue here. And so I pick up my phone and I call Bob and I said, uh, hey, Bob, are you okay? I've been sitting here for about 30 minutes now. Just want to check in on you because I'm such a caring young man. I don't know if you knew that about me, but that's one of my many strengths. Um, just wanted to make sure that you were still okay and we were still on for lunch today. And he said, oh, well, yeah, I, I'm at Kelly's. I said, well, I'm at Kelly's too. He said, oh, really, I, I'm out here on the big front porch that, that wraps all the way around the restaurant. And, and I looked at Kelly's in the middle of a strip center in Sugarland, <laughs> And I realized I was at the wrong location. It gets worse, don't worry. So I, I, I apologize profusely. Bob, I am so, so sorry. I should have clarified. Usually I, I have attention to detail. That's what one of the things people really say about me is how great I am. Uh, but this time I made a mistake. But, but you know what? I know you'll forgive me because I would forgive you in this situation because I am so forgiving. Another great quality of mine. I said, I, I will uh, give me the address. I will be there as soon as I can. And so I type in the address to the correct restaurant. I, I race across down going the speed limit because I'm a Christian and I roll up. I look down at my watch. It is 1245. Okay, I have now arrived 45 minutes late to the most important lunch meeting of my life. And so I run up the stairs about this big wraparound porch and I, I see Bob and I, again, I say, Bob, I am just so, so, so sorry that, for this miscommunication. 100% my fault, but you know what? Lunch is on me. We're gonna have a great time. And so uh, the waitress shows us to our table. We sit down before she's even handed us the menu. Bob says, all right, let's get this over with. Go ahead and ask. I said, no, Bob, this is not how it's worked in the TV shows that I've seen. We're going to sit here. I'm going to buy you lunch, anything you want. We're going to have a nice conversation. Then I'm going to butter you up, and then I'm going to ask you. And he said, fine. So we order our food. He ordered an extra side, because after all, I was paying, and I could, I could do that, not to brag. So uh, he gets his extra side. We, we eat together and, and have a good old time. And, and then towards the end of dinner, finally, I muster up the courage to give that speech. I said, Bob, I, I, I love your daughter. She means the world to me. She is so kind and strong and smart and funny. And, and I want to be with her until death do us part. I, I, I'm going to love her. I'm going to honor her. I'm going to serve her. I'm going to provide for her as much as a Methodist pastor can. And, and, and I, would, I would love nothing more than to have your daughter's hand in marriage. And would you give me that permission, that blessing? And uh, Bob looked at me and said, uh, Son, I'd love to, but I've just got one question for you. Just one question, and, 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 and here's the question. He said, son, who's your best friend? I said, Bob, it's real simple. His name's Bo. Um, <laughs> Uh, he, he was a fraternity brother of mine. He, he's a high school football coach now. He's a great guy. He's gonna be an amazing best man. You know what? On top of that, he's, he's such a good Christian guy that he's gonna make sure that nothing crazy happens at the bachelor party. Uh, I, I don't know you haven't met him yet, but he is incredible. Okay, if you're laughing, you realize how big of a doofus I was and am, right? I thought it was a very simple question. I thought my future father-in-law just wanted to make sure that I had other guys that I could bro out with, iron sharpens iron kind of stuff. That wasn't the question at all. I go on bragging about my friend Bo, and he looks at me and he says, no, son, my daughter is your best friend. <laughs> and I said, that, that's what I said. Did I say Bo? I, that must have, no, I, I, he's my second best friend. Alex is absolutely my best friend. So what happened in that moment is I thought it was a very simple question. I thought it was a very easy question, a softball question I could knock out of the park. And instead, because I missed what the question was actually asking, I gave the wrong answer. So what we're going to see in Luke chapter 18 is a question that is asked of Jesus. It's a question that on its face may seem extremely simple, but as we uncover the layers and we look at Jesus's answer to it, we realize that it's a bit more complex than it may seem on face value. It's a question that's asked by the man who, who we label as the rich young ruler. And if you've grown up in church, you, you might have heard about this story of the rich young ruler. He, he appears in all three, what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all tell his story all in kind of a little bit different ways. And we can piece together and find out that this man is rich and he is young and he is a ruler, probably a civil magistrate. He has done really well for himself. 
And so when he approaches Jesus with an easy question, he might be expecting an easy answer because maybe, we don't really know, but maybe everything's really come easy for this guy. He grew up in the right household. He went to the right schools. He shook the right hands. He made the right investments. He got the right job. Everything has been pretty easy. And so now he's just asking another question, hoping to get an easy answer from Jesus. And whether you've read the gospels before and you've seen people answer or ask questions of Jesus or whether you've prayed to Jesus in prayer, you realize that the answer he gives isn't always easy. It isn't always simple. It isn't always straightforward. And that's what we're gonna see. The story begins in Luke 18, 18 with this very simple question. It says, and a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if there was ever a softball question for Jesus Christ, I gotta think this is it. Okay, he just walks up, he says, hey, what do I gotta do? Wanna live forever, tell, tell me what I gotta do, tell me what kind of prayer I gotta pray, it, it'll be great. I, I think about this, it, it would be a softball question, easy question for you and I. We tell you all the time that to be evangelical in your faith, to share your faith with people in your circles, in your spheres that don't know Jesus. It could be a coworker, it could be a family member, it could be a classmate, it could be a neighbor. We encourage you, tell them about Jesus. And we tell you to do that full well knowing how difficult that is. Right, because we know how Christians are perceived in our culture as angry and, and hateful and judgmental. And so breaking that conversation with your coworker in the cubicle next door, that can be kind of difficult and we get that. So think about how easy this question is then. Let's say your coworker in the cubicle went around to you on a Tuesday morning and said, uh, hey buddy, what do I gotta do to inherit eternal life? Right, you better have an answer for that. That's about as softball as they come. So this is asked of Jesus. He says, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? If you come up to me and ask that, I, I, I'm a good preacher. I, I know how that works. I say, wait till the end of the service when every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And then you just gotta raise your hand or repeat after me and then sign up for the prayer card afterwards so we can put you in our database. That's all it takes. This may seem like a very simple question, but... The reality is it's a much bigger question. See, when you and I hear this question, what must I do to receive eternal life? Your image is probably the same as mine. When I think of eternal life, I think of what happens after we die. The moment after we breathe our last breath on this planet, those of us in Christ Jesus, we know that that's not the end, that we will live on for eternity with him. And so we think eternal life is like that timeline after we die. But for this rich young ruler in his worldview, in his understanding, that, that might not be all that he's asking about. See, for Jews in the first century, they would use this word eternal life, but they weren't specifically talking about what happened after you died. They were talking about the here and the now. Eternal life for this rich young ruler didn't just mean living forever. It meant living abundantly, living fully, living freely in the here and the now. And I hope that you realize, for those of us in Christ Jesus, that's what eternal life is. That eternal life does not begin after you die. It begins the moment you make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Fullness and abundance while we're on this planet and eternity and perfection ever after. This is what the, the professor Brenda Colgen says about eternal life. She says, eternal life is primarily qualitative, rather than quantitative. Eternal describes the kind of life that one has in Christ. It's not just about living forever. That's a part of it and that's a great part of it, but it's about living abundantly in the here and the now. And so when you realize that that's the question that the rich young ruler asked Jesus, you may realize that it's a little bit deeper than what you thought. Uh, the man isn't just trying to get hell insurance. He's like, I've heard about that other place. I don't wanna go there. I wanna make sure I go to the good place. Instead, he's asking, how do I have a full life? In the midst of stress, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain in this life, how can I live fully? How can I live abundantly? It's a great question that you might've asked as well. 
And it's a great question. It's a difficult question that Jesus doesn't just say, hey, pray this prayer and and sign up for this card. He really gives three answers in a short response to the rich young ruler. And listen, if you've heard the rich young ruler before, um, you know kind of how the story ends, that Jesus tells him to give up everything that he owes and and that he has, and he can't do that, and he walks away. So you may be thinking this is all going to be about money. It ain't about money. Instead, what Jesus says is, he says, following after me, having eternal and abundant life. There's a theological component. What goes on in your head, there's a moral component, how you act, what you do, and there's a personal component. And what Jesus is gonna say is you can't have one without the other. And we're gonna see that the rich young ruler misses his opportunity to follow after Jesus because he can't get in line, get in sync with these three things. And you can't have one without the other. There's a theological understanding that you have to have that Jesus is Lord. And you can't just have that mind knowledge. You can't just have the book knowledge of who Christ is and live a terrible life. You can't have all the knowledge in the world and have no reflection of Christ in you. There are those types of people and we call them seminary professors, but but that's not what what the Christian life is about. Now at the same time, there's a moral component to it that we've got to live in such a way that reflects the gospel of Christ, but that alone is not enough. If you just live a really good life and expect to get to heaven when you die, you're going to be up for a rude awakening. If you just help out those in need and walk the proverbial old lady across the street and think that will be enough, Jesus is gonna challenge you here and say it's much more than that. And at the same time, and I think this is especially kind of hurtful for us as as evangelicals in the Bible Belt of Texas, is what Jesus is gonna show us is that it requires those two and not just a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, that is the backbone, but I fear that a lot of us maybe in this room Think, you know what, in the sixth grade, I went to a church camp. And on the last night, I got emotionally manipulated. And at the end of the service, every head was bowed and every eye was closed. And I raised my hand and I came forward and I prayed that prayer. And because that, I can wild out now because in sixth grade, I gave my life to Jesus. And what Jesus is gonna show us in a difficult answer to what turns out to be a difficult question is it's gonna take all three. So he starts out with this theological presupposition, this theological claim that we must believe. He says, theologically, you must acknowledge that Jesus is God. If you're gonna experience eternal life, if you're gonna experience the fullness of joy that Jesus Christ can offer you, you must first in your mind acknowledge that Jesus is God. Not just a historical figure, not just a great role model, not just a great moral teacher, but God in the flesh. This is what Jesus says to the man. We'll read the question again in verse 18. The ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, this is a little bit strange here. Because some scholars would say this is Jesus proving that he didn't believe in his own divinity. There's an argument out there. You can Google it, waste a couple hours of your life, and you can read that the so-called scholars say that Jesus never claimed to be God, that instead his divinity was superimposed on him long after he was dead. And they point to things like this, and they say, you know what? Jesus there was saying, I'm not God. Why, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. But really, Jesus is doing the exact opposite. Instead, he's challenging this man's assumptions. He says, hey, hey, if you're gonna call me good, then you better acknowledge that I'm God. If you're gonna call me good, if you're gonna call me perfect, you're gonna call me without sin, the only person who is that is God the Father. And if you're gonna call me that, you better acknowledge that he and I are one. Jesus says, you can't just believe that I'm a, I'm a role model that I'm some kind of rabbi or that even I'm a great moral teacher. It says to follow after me, to experience eternal life, you must believe that I am God. And really to call Jesus a good moral teacher like so many people do, but then at the same time to claim he is not God, it doesn't make any sense. To say that that Jesus is not God, he's just a good moral teacher, does not logically flow, flow from one another. Think about it this way. 
Okay, some of you, not all of you, some of you, a few of you, very small portion of you, might think that I am a halfway decent preacher. Okay, some of you, halfway decent. No ego here, right? Just like my wife and a couple others. Like, you might think that I'm okay. So if I got up here next week and I stood on our beautiful catwalk stage here and I said, um, hey, Loft Church, uh, so glad you're with us. Guess what? I got a new revelation from the Holy Spirit. You know what he told me? You know that second coming? Right here. It's me. Hello, I'm Jesus. If I ever do that, please leave the church, okay? But think about it. That would be insanity. And you should leave the church if I ever do that. But if I were to do that, then, then everything that I had said before, every halfway decent sermon is now null and void because I am crazy. You couldn't say that I'm a good moral teacher because now I'm a liar in claiming that I am God. And listen, time and time again in the Gospels, and here's just one example of Jesus claiming that he is God. So if you call him a good moral teacher, then a good moral teacher must only tell the truth, which means that he also must be God. C.S. Lewis usually explains things a lot better than I do. Here's what he said about this conundrum. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. He says, that is the one thing that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who said that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Lewis says, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. So who is Jesus to you? A good guy, a historical figure, something you haven't really thought about? Let me challenge you. Don't miss your opportunity for eternal life because you've never wrestled with this question. Don't miss your opportunity to spend eternity with him and have abundance in the here and now because you've never asked yourself the question, do I believe that Jesus is God? So I mentioned that, that Jesus oftentimes throughout the gospels when he's asked a question, he, he answers with another question. He, he, he tells a story, but, but one time he gives a pretty clear definition when somebody asks him, what is eternal life? And he didn't talk about clouds. He didn't talk about streets of gold. Instead, this is what Jesus said eternal life is in John 17. He says that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you want to know what eternal life means? Do you want to experience abundance and fullness of life? Jesus says, acknowledge I am who I say I am. Know me and know peace. So this is the first challenge that he gives to the rich young ruler, but then the next challenge, he actually passes. Jesus says, you've got to believe, if you're going to call me good, you've got to believe that I am God, but then you also have to live a moral life. And here's the moral claim. You must live a life worthy of the gospel. He's gonna say to this rich young ruler is what he's saying to us that, that to receive eternal life here and now and for all eternity, we must live a life worthy of the gospel. You and I, if you are marked by Christ Jesus, you should live your life in a different way. Now, let me be clear about something. Living your life in a different way, doing good things, avoiding sin, does not earn your ticket to heaven. But instead, it shows that you have been marked, you have been transformed, you have been redeemed and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, and so you want to live your life in a different way. This is what Jesus says to the rich young ruler in verse 20. He says, uh, listen, guy, you know the commandments. You're a good Jew. Do not commit adultery. 
Do not murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And the rich young ruler said, check. All these I have kept from my youth. So follow with me a a little bit the the question and the answer that's gone on here. This man is asked, uh, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? Abundance now, eternity before ever. What do I gotta do? And Jesus goes, well, what are the commandments? What are the laws that that God has given you? And and if I were to read it between the lines there, I would be like, hey, Jesus, um, are are you saying that we can earn our way into heaven? Uh, Like, Jesus, are you saying that just by following the ways of the commandments that, that we can receive eternal life? I was reading this and wrestling this and realizing like, hey, Jesus, you ever read Paul? Like we are saved by grace through faith so that no one can boast. Like, like don't you know, Jesus, that, that works don't save us? Like Jesus, slow down, you heretic, okay? Like, like just take a step back. Here's a little hint in reading the Bible. If you ever think that Jesus might be heretical and, and you disagree with something that Jesus says, chances are he's not wrong, you are. See, because what Jesus is saying here is not that these things will, will earn you eternal life, but if you want to experience eternal life, you'll follow in the ways of Jesus. You'll follow in the ways of the laws of God. And, and listen, this is what makes Christianity so distinct among every other world religion. Every other world religion, um, they, they all have their own distinctives, but, but here's what they, they boil down to is, is I obey and therefore I am accepted. I, I obey the church's teaching. I, I obey the laws. I, I obey the Sabbath. I, I obey these customs. I, I obey my mother and my father. I obey, 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 obey. And if I have obeyed enough, then I will hopefully be accepted by God, whoever God is, and into eternal life. But Christianity completely flips that on its head. See, for followers of Jesus, we don't believe that we obey so we are accepted. Instead, we believe because we are accepted, we obey. Because God has come down in Jesus Christ, live a life that we couldn't live, died the death that we deserve to redeem us, to reconcile us, to forgive us, we have been accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ and our only response is then to obey to live a life worthy of the gospel, to put aside sin. And and listen, I'm I'm a Methodist. I don't know if I'm a good Methodist, but I'm a Methodist. And and we Methodists, we we really like grace and we really like forgiveness and that's all good because God likes that too. But sometimes we can err too far on the side of grace. We we don't wanna get in your business. We don't wanna tell you that you're sinful. We don't wanna tell you you're bad. Instead, it's so much better to tell you that, that of all the special snowflakes, You are the most special snowflake. And your struggle is your struggle, and that's okay because God loves you through it. And listen, that's true. But at the same time, Jesus' message is live in a different way. Go and do not sin. Last week, Rob talked about the woman who was caught in adultery and how she's brought out in front of Jesus. And in this time, she would be stoned to death. And so a mob forms around her. They've all got their stones. And they say, Jesus, can we stone this woman? And he says, yeah, if you're without sin. If you are perfect, if you've never done anything wrong, if you've never sinned, then go ahead and cast the first stone. And one by one, those stones begin to drop. I think I may preach a series one time called What Grace Sounds Like. I think stones hitting the ground for that woman. It's that sound of grace. And one by one, those stones drop and they begin to walk away. And Jesus looks down at the woman. And he says, hey, where are your accusers? Are there any here? And she says, no, there's not. And, and here's what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't look at this woman and say, you're the most special snowflake. Of all the snowflakes out there, you're the most special. Take my grace, take my forgiveness, and live your truth. No, he says to the woman, great, you are forgiven. Now go and leave your life of sin. A couple chapters later, John, 
There's a man who's by a pool for 38 years. He cannot walk. He's an invalid and he's waiting to be healed. And then finally he encounters the powerful healing miracle of Jesus Christ. Jesus heals this man. He picks up the mat that has bound him for nearly four decades and he walks away. And then we're told that later Jesus encounters him in the temple. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, buddy, man, of all the special snowflakes, you're my most special snowflake. I'm so proud of you. Look at you walking around. Now, what does Jesus say? He says, see, you are well. Sin no more so that nothing worse may happen to you. There's this rhythm of being reconciled, being healed, being redeemed, and then sent into a life of obedience. And eternal life requires that. Not just a one-time thing, not just a sixth grade church camp, not just a dunk in a pool of water, but day by day, as the scripture says, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, seeking to live a life worthy of the gospel. Now, to the rich young ruler's credit, he, he, he checks this box. He, he says, yeah, I've, I've done these since I was young. But then... Jesus gives him the one thing, asks him for the one thing that he just can't give up. See, Jesus gets personal. And the personal challenge for the rich young ruler, for us to not miss our opportunities, is you must give up everything to follow after Jesus. It's not just believing in your mind that he is God. It's not just living a good life. The mark of a true disciple, the mark of one who has experienced eternal life is one that would turn their back on every treasure of this world to follow after Jesus. Look what he says to this man in verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to the rich young ruler, listen, one thing you still lack, Sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Now, part of my sermon writing process is to go and and to watch YouTube videos, to listen to sermons of preachers that are much better than me, and then to uh, borrow, steal their best stuff. Okay, that was a big struggle this week. Because ain't a lot of preachers like to preach on this kind of stuff. Because the implication here is he said, hey, hey, if you want to follow me, you got to sell everything that you own. You want to empty out a church real fast? Tell people to do that, right? But really, I, I don't think this is primarily about money. I don't think it's primarily about wealth. Because this is the only time in Jesus' 33 years on this planet that he tells a rich young man to do this, to sell everything that he has and come follow after me. In fact, a couple of chapters later, Jesus encounters another very rich man. It was a man whose name was Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus was um, a wee little man, um, and, and a And a wee little man was he, and he climbed up on a sycamore tree to see what he could see, and he sees Jesus. Just write a song. He he sees Jesus. And Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And he knows that Zacchaeus probably has more money than this rich young ruler. But he doesn't say to Zacchaeus, hey, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow after me. Instead, he looks at Zacchaeus and he says, let's do dinner tonight. Which says to me, it's not about the money. But it's about where your identity is. It's about where your security is. It's about where your comfort is. It's about where your treasures are. And maybe that you, that personal thing that Jesus is asking you to give up, maybe it is your wealth. And wealth's not a bad thing. Oftentimes the things that we make a God out of are our good things. It could be your job. It could be your family. It could be your hobbies. It could be your children. All good gifts from God that we need to be willing to lay down at the foot of the cross to follow 
after Jesus. This is what Jesus says in Luke chapter nine. He says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, hey, I'm gonna follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, hey, come follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And then Jesus, I, I, I wouldn't make this move, but he does. He says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Like the Greek word is yikes there. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, hey, I'm gonna follow you, Lord, but let me first say bye to my friends at my house. And Jesus is like, no one who puts the hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see how it's not just about money. It's about anything that stands in your way of pursuing Jesus fully. It's about not worshiping the treasures of this earth, though they may be treasures because you realize that treasures in heaven are infinitely more valuable. And I don't know what that is for you, and you might not know what that is for you, but, but let me put it into a context that might sting a little bit. Let me ask you this question first. Um, what do you think heaven looks like? Right? The, the Bible gives us lots of different images. We, we see sky, uh, the sky, we see clouds, we see streets of gold, we hear uh, uh, mansions, we see thrones, we see angels, we see saints, we see white robes, we see a lot of those pictures, some of them metaphorical, some of them literal. We have a general sense of what heaven is like, and then there's a lot of gaps that we kind of fill in. And, and so maybe when you think about heaven, you, uh, you think about those things, the, the streets of gold, the crown of jewels upon your head, the mansion that you will be in. Maybe you think what's gonna be great about heaven is that I, I get to be reunited with all the loved ones that have gone before me. Uh, maybe for you, uh, heaven is a, is a lake stocked with bass or Augusta National uh, 12 months out of the year, a, a great garden that you can always be in. Uh, maybe for you, it, it's just a, a sheer utopia where um, there, there is no pain, there uh, is no suffering, there is no fear, there are no cats, where it is just beautiful all the time, always. I don't know what your picture of heaven is like. But what if you get to heaven and heaven is none of those things? What if after you breathe your last breath on this earth, you begin that part of your eternal life in a blank room? Four white walls, a white ceiling, a white floor, a room completely empty except for Jesus. Would that be a place that you want to go? Would that be the place of your biggest fulfillment of nothing else but Jesus? If it's not, even if you had a bit of hesitation there, then make sure that you're not worshiping the treasures of this earth and you're not just worshiping Jesus for the stuff that he can give you. So what he says to this rich young ruler is, lay it all down. Anything that keeps you from following after me, lay it down. And we know that the man can't do this, but let's see how the story ends. Jesus, seeing that the man had become sad, said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So listen, my intention on preaching the story of the rich young ruler is to not give you anxiety about your salvation. It's not to make you feel guilty about loving your family well or having a lot of money. I preach this because I don't want you to miss your opportunity. 
I don't want you to be so in love with the things of this world. I don't want you to just have a vague sense of who Jesus is and miss on the chance for eternal life in the, in the long after and abundant life in the here and the now. And listen, if that is you and you felt this kind of anxiety, this worry, have I done enough? Am I good enough? Let those words of Jesus ring loudly in your ears for it's impossible with man, but nothing is possible with God. See, the purpose of the cross and the empty tomb was not to make you see how dirty you are and how far you had to come. It was instead to see how beautiful Christ Jesus is. So if you worry if you have that fear welling up and you know it's not about what you can do, it's about what he has done on our behalf. Live a life knowing him, live a life worthy of the gospel and live a life turning your back on this treasures of all the treasures of this earth so that you will receive treasures in heaven. Let me pray for us. Well, God, we do thank you for this difficult word. We thank you that Jesus did not answer a question in a simple way, that, that he took it to teach us what eternal life really was. So God, I pray for all of us that we can learn more and we can grow deeper in our understanding of what it means to leave, live fully and forever. God, help us each day to die to ourselves, to resist sin, to resist temptation, and to lay down the things that keep us from you at the foot of the cross. And God, most of all, we think that all of that, thank you that all of that uh, isn't worthy of you. That we can't earn our ticket to heaven, but that we don't have to because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray.